explore, everyone. I'm Steve Savant, syndicated financial columnist and money color commentator. On today's show, constructing and decoding indexes, part two in our series on index investing. This is just a basic idea. This is just a basic entry level education on indexing, just so you can dip your toe in it. We're certainly not gonna manage this at the high MBA level. Now, we just want you to get some understanding. Constructing and crafting an index begins with making some critical decisions. What is the focus gonna be on? What is the portfolio contents? What is the weighting of the portfolio? What's the criteria for change? And how are we gonna do the calculation on this? So we just wanna know, do I really wanna do the calculation? Do I wanna learn the math and science of this? You probably don't. And you, if you don't, then you're gonna be deferring to a registered investment advisor. You wanna make sure that the registered investment advisor and or a security licensed registered rep actually knows this. So they have basic mechanics so they can keep you educated, explain the math and why it works so that you can have an understanding. Remember, when you're using indexes, doesn't matter if it's foreign or domestic, most of these ideas, these five points, are gonna be embedded in the thought process. As I said in the first segment, we're talking about methodology and an approach to index. When we're talking about index, we're talking about a security. When we're talking about a security, you could lose principal, you could lose your money. So you just gotta keep in mind, did you do a risk tolerance test? But I still think indexing is somewhat a mitigating uh, a product to mitigate against some risk. Not all, but some of it. So when I'm looking at this, I'm looking at trying to figure out what the weighted income is. Now I just wanna, the outcome is. So let me just move up here a little bit and talk about weighting the outcome. Most stock indexes are weighted, which means that some stocks in the index have greater impact on the outcome of the calculation than others. And by the way, I kinda like that because I'll get into this, I think it's in the next section, where we'll talk about, well, why don't I just cherry pick the good ones then out of the index and make my own index? Some people actually do that. So I wanna look at that also capitalization weighted indexes are designed to reflect the economic impact of companies with the highest market capitalization. So that kind of rules, some of the people inside, some of the companies inside the index are heavy hitters. They're highly capitalized. So they kind of sometimes throw their weight around in the index. So again, sometimes it's kind of like, wow, I might wanna cherry pick that and make my own index. But if you're looking at this, I'm just giving you some basic ideas. Pre-weighted indexes are more impactful by change in the prices of higher price stocks than by the changes in the value of lower price stocks. So the Dow Jones average is a price weighted index as is the Japanese Nikkei index. So that's a weighted, and you say every day we see the Dow Jones on, and if you look at that and you're looking at a good idea of where the economy is, you're getting a thumbnail sketch, kind of a bullet outline of where the market is and where it's going. That's a pretty good indicator to kind of see where we're going. And then of course, in equal weighted indexes, on the other hand, each security has the same weight regardless of the market cap. So that's where you're trying to, this, if you have socialism in, in indexing, there it is. Everybody's kind of treated equally in their participation and they're weighted the same. The fundamental weight index includes securities notable for one or more fundamental measures, such as a history of providing high dividend yield. Listen, if I was just sitting there, maybe for income, because I not only get the S&P appreciation if I hold for a little while, but I'm getting a dividend off that. I could reinvest it, maybe I wanna take it out. It just depends upon what your needs are. And when you have high returns, well, like from 2009, all the way up to maybe uh, halfway through 2015, People started taking money off the table. They had profited, they had a pretty good run. So they started taking it out. Some people took it in dividends, took, some people took it in appreciation, some people took both. So remember, when you're looking at this, you're looking at this as, as a fundamental weighted index, and one of those is maybe a history of providing a high dividend yield. Another is index analysis. If you're investing in index-based product, you need to know how, what the underlying index is weighted and the impact that that weighting system is likely to have on performance. Remember, we don't care about any of this, but we do care about how it affects performance. And I don't know about you, but if weighted, if I need to look a little bit and become a little bit schooled in weighted analysis and indexing, it doesn't matter if I'm using it on an annuity, a life insurance contract, an index uh, fund, or a mutual fund, I need to have a little bit of on this. So I don't want to get too deeply into it, but just remember index analysis, you might want to look a little bit and again have your RIA or your registered rep explain it to you. New incarnations. Once the index has been created, it may be used to create a number of smaller, more focused indices, or it may combine with one or more other indexes to create a broader index or subsidize 
or, or I'm sorry, subdivided to create style-based indexes, such as growth indexes or value indexes. I see a lot of people doing aggressive growth indices. Some do balanced fund indices. They're just trying to look at different ways to comp composite so they can hit their goal. Now, when I'm decoding, sometimes people say, Steve, I, I have a hard time decoding all this. Well, I agree, and that's why I still think you need a registered investment advisor or somebody that can really help you. Now, I want to talk about this. Another approach, instead of using a divisor, which we're going to talk to about in a second, to find the present change in an index or percentage change in an index, an index provider can calculate the percentage change in each securities price and combine them to determine an index level. So the result is the same, but the second method preferred is the index securities using this type of approach because they have different currencies involved. So I'm gonna walk through a little bit of the math to say that's, the, that's another approach. This is the approach I'm gonna talk about. And the only reason I brought this up is because we have to at least dress it. I wanna talk about the basic one. And here it is, we're gonna do a little math here. And it's not hard, but it's not, I wouldn't say it's easy either. I'm just gonna walk you through it. So index values are calculated on an ongoing basis throughout every trading day. Remember, some people say it's an advantage to have index funds rather than mutual funds that have indexing in them because I can sell the index fund anytime during the day in the market, whereas the mutual fund is gonna settle at the end of the day. Everybody's different on this approach. I leave it to you and your uh, registered investment advisor to talk about that. Prices of the stock in the index and a series are particular moments. So for every, so often, the S&P is updated every 15 seconds. When I go on my iPhone to look at the S&P, I'm, I'm looking at that, that's changing all the time. So it's outsourcing all this data and I get a current pulse why it's happening, why it's current. Number of outstanding shares for each company are in an index. The weighting factor, which is gonna be used to find the number of floating shares or unsold shares, outstanding shares. And the divisor or scale factor. Now the first step is you wanna sit there and say, you wanna say what is the price for each stock and multiply that number of floating shares. So whatever the price is, I'm gonna look at the outstanding shares and then next I'm gonna take the individual values and add them up to find the total value of the components. And that amount is gonna be divided by what they call the divisor. So let's just look through this, just a basic idea. Price, okay, times, and let's just do the math inside. Number of shares times weighted factor times the price divided by the divisor equals the index level. That kind of gives us an idea. Now, how does that work in real math? The matter of scale, the index divisor is set at the time of the index when it's created and it's modified over time to keep the index stable as changes are made to the index portfolio. For example, if the hypothetical market value at the end of the trading day is 14 billion and the index level is 20, the divisor was 0.7 billion, so I just do the math and it comes out and it tells me then my X factor, my divisor is gonna be, is gonna give me the number, my level is 0.7. Now, is that good or bad? It depends upon the index, it depends upon what you're trying to get done. Again, basic math, nobody does this, 90% of most investors, either their investment advisor is doing this or they're just looking at the bottom number. But if, I guess if you had to pull this apart and do the math, and I have a book on this, again, published by Lightball Press that walks you through all this. And remember, we're looking for the, how to factor in what the dividend yield is. And some of us, depending upon your taxable event, remember, it's not only your tax bracket, but how long did I hold this, whether I'm gonna pay capital gains or I'm gonna pay ordinary income tax. That to me is strategic. I'm really in these for a long haul, so I should be thinking capital treatment on taxes in a non-qualified event. Remember, <coughs> excuse me, remember, if this is in a qualified plan, there is no basis. So when you recover this money, it's all gonna be taxable and all of it's gonna be included uh, in your provisional income test for Social Security. So when you're making purchases, remember, even in the background, we're doing indexing for diversification and we like the idea of it because it has so many companies involved. But remember, there's tax consequences to this, not only for its straight up value as an investment, but it may have tax consequences for Social Security. So keep it in mind, it's one way to look at it. You need to look at it. And remember, I want to know what the floating shares or outstanding shares are. It kind of gives me an idea. Is this a hot index? Are people buying this? It's a little side note, really. But really, when I'm looking at it, I'm looking to find out because I care about one thing and one thing only. I'm a total rate of return guy. So if I'm trying to find the total rate of return of a stock like an S&P 500, which is widely quoted on the benchmark, as I've said before, it's a calculation that depends on the change in the index, either positive or negative, plus reinvested dividends. And remember, as I've said before, annuities and 
index universal life and very and, and those two do not have participation in dividend where the variable has participation so some people do a trade-off on that and say the expense loads which are a little expensive for variable universal life maybe the trade-off is okay because i do get to participate in dividends in that so i'm looking at total rate of return that's what i'm trying to figure out finding out the total rate of return and i want to know that and hopefully my registered investment advisor or registered rep who's helping me walking me through it knows it enough to explain it to me don't forget to watch our next segment on U.S. and foreign indices, part three in our series on index investing. And keep in mind, before moving forward with any of the ideas on our show, always check with your tax consultant, legal counsel, or financial advisor. You've been watching Steve Savant's Money, the name of the game. <laughs>